They've done studies. And what they found is if you, as a reader, walk into a bookstore and you don't know what book you want to buy, I, as an author, have about 30 seconds to sell you my book. What's the first thing you're going to notice when you walk into the bookstore? The cover. So hopefully you've got a cover that's going to attract the eye. I like the cover of this book. I love the cover of this book. <laughs> um, if you've got their eye and they pick it up, the next thing they're typically going to do is turn it over to see what kinds of nice things have been said about you. Then they're going to open the dust jacket flap, which contains a synopsis of the story to see if it's the kind of story they might want to read. And the last thing they're going to do, typically speaking, is open to that very first page to see if it's the kind of book they might want to read. If you're the kind of writer who writes in a manner that they could appreciate. So, if you can put something on that very first page that's going to grab them, you've done everything you can as an author to sell your book. I'm going to read you the very first page <laughs> of Vermilion Drift to show you what I did. What I decided to do was to focus on one of the other elements of those three that I pulled out of the refrigerator with my imagination. I decided I was going to focus on Pork's relationship with his father because I'd begun to realize as I thought more about this story that that relationship was much more complicated and conflicted than I had ever realized. And so I thought, that's the way I'm going to bring readers into the story. This is how Vermilion Drift begins. And it's just a, I'm going to read it to you because it's just a page and because I think it's really good. <laughs> it goes like this. Some nights, Corcoran O'Connor dreams his father's death. Although the dream differs in the details, it always follows the same general pattern. His father falls from a great height. Sometimes he stumbles backward over a precipice, his face an explosion of surprise. Or he's climbing a high, flat face of rock, and just as he reaches for the top, loses his grip, and in falling, appears both perplexed and angry. Or he steps into an empty elevator shaft, expecting a floor that isn't there, and looks skyward with astonishment as the darkness swallows him. In the dream, Cork is always a boy. He's always very near and reaches out to save his father, but his arm is too short, his hand too small. Always his father is lost to him, and Cork stands alone and heartbroken. If that was all of it, if that was the end of the nightmare, it probably wouldn't haunt him in quite the way that it does. But the true end is a horrific vision that jars Cork awake every time. In the dream, he relives the dream. And in that dream revisited, something changes. Not only is he near his father as the end occurs, but he also stands outside the dream watching it unfold a distant witness to himself and to all that unfolds. And what he sees from that uninvolved perspective delivers a horrible shock. For his hand, in reaching out, not only fails to save his father, it is his small hand, in fact, that shoves him to his death. Now you keep reading that book. <laughs> which includes Northwest Angle. I was, when I was traveling a couple of years ago doing book events for Heaven's Keep, I was telling my audiences that this was the last Cork O'Connor novel, at least for a while, because I had other things that I wanted to do. My publisher was pushing me really hard to uh, sign another book contract, um, but I was, um, I was uh, really reluctant to do that, because I had other things that I wanted to do, and for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I ended up changing my mind for two reasons. First of all, the economy tanked, and, uh, and my wife was quick to point out to me that Cork O'Connor does a pretty good job of helping us pay the rent. <laughs> and the other thing was is that I had that, that, what I thought was a terrific idea for the hook and pull for Vermilion Drift. So I knew I could write one book. I know I can do the Vermilion Drift thing. But they wanted two books from me, which is not unusual when you're dealing with the New York Publishing House. And I still kept pushing back and pushing back because I didn't want to commit to signing a contract for a book I had no idea uh, what it might be about. Um, I was so reluctant to, for this reason. How many of you ha who are, 
avid fans of, of mystery series have had this experience. You've been reading a series you absolutely love, and suddenly, in the course of that of reading, you come across a book in that series that's very different from all the others. It doesn't have a heart to it. It's soulless. There's no energy. I think you're reading a contractual obligation. You're reading somebody who signed on for two or three books. They've, they're exhausted after a couple of them, but they have a deadline to meet. And so they cobble something together. They put it out there with their name on it. And, you know, I never, I never want to have a book like that out there with my name on it. So I was very reluctant uh, to sign the contract. But I, but I finally did, and ultimately for this reason. I'm Methodist, which is neither here nor there. But as a good Methodist kid, I finally decided that when the time was right, God would deliver the story to me. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> it really is. And here, here's the story. It was remarkable. <laughs> I travel, I often travel with a group of uh, two other Minnesota writers. We call ourselves the Minnesota Crime Wave, which we, was, we were the Minnesota Crime Wave when we visited uh, uh, Northwind before. And we happened to be doing the Kichigami Library System about a year and a half ago. That's uh, the Bemidji area, doing events up there. And one evening after we uh, did a book event, the librarian took us out to, uh, for drinks. God, I love librarians like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, so we're sitting around the local bar and we're, we're tossing back beer. And, uh, and talk eventually turns to a discussion of the northwest angle of Minnesota. The northwest angle. Anybody here know what the northwest angle of Minnesota is? Oh, I'm shocked. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good representation. Uh, if, when I ask that question outside the Midwest, nobody has a clue. You know, and really, I didn't know what the Northwest Angle was before we began talking. Okay, I'm gonna, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, quick geography lesson. The Northwest Angle of Minnesota. Here's a map of Minnesota. It goes along Lake Superior. The arrowhead goes along over here, kind of stretches this way. Then the border with Canada runs like this, along the Rainy River. And as you get to the northwest side of the state, there's this little rectangular jut up into Canada. Looks like a chimney. They call it the Chimney of Minnesota. Then the border continues. Up in that chimney of Minnesota is the northwest angle. It's completely separated from the rest of the United States from Minnesota. And the reason we have it is as a result of a misunderstanding during the boundary discussions that set the border with Canada, and the, the source of the misunderstanding was simply where the headwaters of the Mississippi River actually lay. They ended up being farther west than anybody imagined. So we got this little piece of Canada. It is, in fact, the northernmost point in the 48 contiguous states. In order to get there, you have to cut through 60 miles of Canadian backwoods or shoot across 40 miles of open water on Lake of the Woods. Lake of the Woods, the 14th largest freshwater lake in the Western Hemisphere. It has 14, over 14,000 islands in it. Almost all of them uninhabited. And because the border with Canada runs through Lake of the Woods, it's impossible to patrol. So Lake of the Woods has become a hotbed for international smuggling. Okay, so you've got this unusual geographic anomaly up here on this enormous lake with 14,000 islands where anything could be going on and it's a hotbed for smuggling. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I got back to St. Paul, I had, I had the, uh, a pretty good idea of what uh, Northwest Angle, which is the next book, uh, was going to be about. Um, I, I wrote it and it's scheduled for publication uh, at the end of August, basically September. We just uh, got a starred review from Publishers Weekly, which is a very good thing, and uh, so I'm really excited about it. And if you buy this, I think if you haven't already ordered it uh, from Amazon, you should come back here and buy it from, from Northwind. Buy locally, buy independently. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm off my soapbox.